So yeah, uh, Nat, if you want, let's just start this while everyone's uh, joining. Um, I want to let Gary speak early on too, just because he's on a time schedule and he has a, a pretty cool story to share. So whenever his mic gets connected, I'll work with that. Uh, I'll work with on that with him. Uh, if you can just kind of introduce yourself, I know a lot of people know you, but I just want to get your SEO background so we can understand that. And then we'll just do a quick introduction and then we'll start on the topic of link building and then we'll go from there. I know a lot of people have questions about this, so I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, sounds good. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. My name is Nat Militic. Um, I have a web development company. I've had it for years, uh, since 2007. Um, yeah, I just started getting active on Twitter about you know a year and a half to two years ago, I would say. And uh, SEO uh, itself, I kind of fell into it, I have to say. Like I started doing it um, probably, I want to say, a year and a half or two years ago or so. Um, I always kind of knew the basics, but uh, my main goal was to you know rank my own uh, agency website uh, a little bit higher on the on the search engines and you know I thought uh, just like just like learning web development one of the you know one of the best ways to learn something is to try to apply it and try to do a project so my project was trying to rank my own website and um, I learned a lot through the process and you know I'm still learning I'm not an expert by any means <laughs> so um, I'm still learning about SEO every day. It's a you know vast uh, topic. Uh, there's a lot of subspecialties in the space, but um, yeah, maybe we can answer some questions. Again, I'm not you know uh, I'm not, I'm not a, definitely not an expert, um, but uh, I do dabble in uh, SEO quite a bit. So uh, thanks for having me, Dennis. That's my little intro. Yeah, awesome. It sounds like we have a somewhat of a similar intro there uh, as far as needing to do SEO for a personal project. So uh, that's actually how I got started too. So I'll kind of give my background then. Um, I actually started wanting to do some affiliate marketing. That was kind of my whole intro to web development actually as a whole and never did that uh, before anything else. And basically in that process, I learned about having to build a landing page. I had no idea what the hell a landing page was. And uh, I realized I needed to build websites. So a landing page was basically a page on a website that you send somebody to. So in that process, uh, I was doing a lot of work and I learned about this concept of SEO and I thought, okay, if I learn SEO, I can generate a lot of free traffic outside of any paid advertising or posting on social networks or anything like that. So I uh, decided to kind of dig into it and I got the book, uh, The Art of SEO, and I actually built out a website in Wix and I needed a project to practice on. Like you mentioned, the best way to learn is to just kind of start you know, applying it to something. So I started building out this website and I had a buddy in the locksmith industry and I thought, okay, that's something kind of interesting. I can build out a local website, get it ranked locally and uh, just see what happens. So as I was reading through the book, I was applying all the methods, just kind of following along, doing the basic uh, markup, like making sure all my meta tags were correct, all the headers and everything like that was looking good. So I actually ended up ranking that site, the site rank in about maybe a month and a half. I uh, actually got to page one and I started getting phone calls for this fake business that I created. So I realized I can do this thing. This is kind of interesting. Like it kind of happened quickly. So I basically just started offloading calls to uh, some competitors and then eventually formed a little business around it. So that was my intro to SEO and then eventually formed a, an agency around it. First starting with WordPress or Wix websites because I had no experience with anything else and then moving on to WordPress. So that was kind of my intro. Uh, Gary, if you can hear us right now, uh, let us know, maybe try to speak up here. I want to hear your introduction too. Just, uh, we just got Nats and want to see if you can hear us at this point. So I guess we'll, uh, we'll wait when Gary jumps on. It looks like his speaker is muted and, uh, we'll just continue here. So Nat, let's actually start with the first topic. So you made a post, uh, it was about link building and basically your post in summary said, with today's SEO, you still think link building is the number one strategy. That was kind of interesting because it was never really my approach. So I commented on that and I responded that I didn't feel like it was the number one approach. And then based off of yours and Gary's responses, we, you kind of changed my mind, I guess, but it was more in the context of what you're referring to it or how you were referring to it. So if you can, can you elaborate on why you feel like link building today? So link building for anybody 
in a second, I'm getting a phone call. Getting a backlink from another website that adds domain authority to yours. So imagine if uh, you got some kind of article published and then the New York Times linked to your website. It would give credibility to your website and the stronger that website is that's linking to you would give you more power. So that's kind of the idea of backlinks if anybody uh, doesn't know what that is. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so basically, I mean, you know, backlinks are not technically required for you to rank a particular piece of content or a website on Google. So if you had, you know, for example, uh, a page on your website saying Nat Militic is the best WordPress developer in the world, uh, you could probably rank for that uh, without any backlinks, right? But if you wanted to rank for something like best WordPress developer, it would be a little bit harder. And, and, and what that depends on is basically, you know, that what, what they call kind of like a keyword difficulty or, you know, basically the competition for that particular keyword. If you want to take it a step further, for example, if you're trying to rank for men's running shoes, um, same thing. Good luck, right? Like you're basically trying to compete with sites like Nike or, you know, Foot Locker or whatever, right? Um, so it, it really depends on, you know, what keywords you're trying to target and also, you know, how competitive that particular keyword is or phrase or term or whatever, right? And that's where, you know, your authority when it comes to, you know, how, uh, Google, you know, ranks your website or how how highly it values it. That depends on uh, on on you know those links that you're getting from from other websites. And so you know you need to you need to build that over time. Um, and you know there's good ways to do it. There's bad ways to do it. Um, obviously, you know and any kind of serious SEO will tell you for sure that you know, backlinks are, are definitely still the number one ranking factor when it comes to, you know, those competitive keywords or competitive phrases or terms that you might want to rank for. So definitely not required. I wouldn't say it's required for everything because, again, if you have like a very niche um, uh, a website, very niche piece of content or page or whatever that you want to rank, it's possible to rank for that uh, as long as obviously Google indexes your site. It's possible to rank for that without any backlinks. However, um, when you start getting into more competitive ones, um, that's when you're going to need uh, some backlinks and some authority kind of pointing to your website in order to rank for those particular keywords and terms. Yeah, so that actually is kind of a good point right there because it's such a vague topic, SEO in general, but really it depends on what you're dealing with as far as competitors, the industry, and the keyword. Now, the reason why I didn't, or at least why I didn't have it on the top there, I mean, it's it's definitely important and I understand that, but it's something that I don't consider one of the top ranking factors, but with your take on that, it does make sense in what you're trying to say, specifically when you have competitors doing the same thing. Uh, for me personally, I've ranked for some very difficult keywords with absolutely no backlink strategy. Now, my primary focus was the quality of content. Now, I know somebody just posted this in the comment section and I want to discuss it they basically made the point that if you build a good website and uh, just do good work on it, it will rank by default. While that does have some merit to it, it's definitely not true. But that is kind of the approach that I took outside of maybe generating other social signals. So that's that was kind of my take on it because it wasn't such a, a heavy approach. And there's obviously the negative connotations to it too. There's people that use black hat methods where they're buying backlinks or they're getting low quality backlinks. And that does the opposite where you can actually get your website blacklisted and it can actually hurt you uh, in the long run. So, yeah, that was kind of like my main take on it yeah, and, and sure. backlinking. Um, I think you made a good point where the site, because of the content, did generate backlinks on its own. So it means that I still got backlinks regardless of whether I was using that as a strategy or not. I just wasn't actively you know, doing a lot of outreach and trying to get that link. I just wrote good content for any client that I had or made sure they were writing it. And I think by default, they still got that ranking or I still got those backlinks, therefore a better ranking because of the, I guess, authentic content. And that actually creates the best kind of backlinks because it's not, uh, you're less likely to have 
uh, black hat methods where maybe the link isn't good or uh, may have something attached to it that it shouldn't, maybe a, a bad approach to it. Uh, now, I want to actually yeah. bring up Gary here. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt this conversation. I actually want to get back to it. But Gary is just going to speak because he can't hear us for some reason. And I just want to let him introduce himself and also talk about this link building strategy because he was one of the people that chimed in on this conversation. So if you don't mind, I'll just bring him up in sure. a second. Gary, I'm going to add you. And if you can't hear us, just talk away and we'll, uh, we'll give you a minute and then we'll meet you again. Well, I guess uh, we'll just go from here. And <laughs> now I guess we can continue because Gary's <laughs> mic is not working. So, yeah. Yeah, no worries. No, no worries. Yeah, Gary's having some technical difficulties. Yeah, I mean, um, definitely, you know, I saw that comment too. And, and I kind of um, even like, you know, it's almost like accidental ranking or accidental SEO in a way where, you know, you're focused on basically, you know, generating and creating good content and, and creating content that people want to link to naturally and, and kind of read naturally and engage with naturally, which is the best way, really. I mean, so, you know, even though you're not technically, you know, pursuing, uh, you know, outreach or getting links from sites, you're probably getting them naturally as well, um, which is actually, you know, the, the, the way that Google wants you to do it. <laughs> Google yeah. doesn't want you to do link building manually or, you know, using, uh, you know, using different methods, like you mentioned, or paying for links is the worst. But basically, you know, the, the every kind of link building strategy, quote unquote, is technically black hat, right? Yeah, like, true. Because you're, you're supposed to get them naturally, essentially. So it's, you know, it's, it's tricky to say. Um, I know people will say, look, SEO is dead and, you know, you, you can you just write good content and people will discover it and stuff like that. And that's totally great. And that's totally fine when you're in a space that may not have a lot of competition. But if you're trying to rank for something that has high competition that you want to sort of pursue that, um, uh, you know, other people are writing about or creating, then it's going to be harder without uh, having a higher domain authority and having some people linked to that content. So, yeah, ab absolutely. And that kind of leads to my next point, because that was my response, where if you're generating those natural backlinks the way Google wants you to rank them or to get them, uh, that means that you've done your job on the other part, which is generating good content. And that was honestly my personal approach. So outside of the technicals and uh, just making sure that all the meta tags are there and the content is written well and structured. Uh, the biggest thing that I saw, at least the, the thing that I went after, was simply on page time and click-through rates and bounce rates. So I always wanted to make sure that I had a good headline, that if someone came to my site, I wanted to make sure I had an above average on page time. So that means that if someone comes to your site, because Google can see all of this, they can track or any search engine, I guess, they're... They're tracking how people behave on that site. And if somebody comes to your site, let's say you blast an email to, you know, let's say 20,000 people. But if people come on that site and they, they leave within a matter of seconds, even though you got that site traffic, that's actually going to have a negative impact on, on the website. So my strategy was always this. Create great content. Make sure that the reason why people came there is what they see. So if I'm trying to advertise some kind of shoes that I'm selling, I want to make sure that even though there's a way to keep that person on longer, that they get exactly what they were looking for. Now, once I achieve the main approach in just making sure that the user has a good experience, I want to make sure that they're on that site longer. So I want to eliminate bounce rates, and then I want to keep time on site going. And this is a huge factor I've seen from my experience that has actually helped me. Uh, I've read a lot of articles about it from Neil Patel. There was Brian Dean. Uh, if you can keep people on your site through great content or maybe just linking within the site. That means like having an article in your site and then linking that from another page on your site. So just having the user navigate, that had a very big impact. So as far as my strategies go, that was, was the biggest thing that I've yeah. seen and has worked very effectively. I haven't had a site that I couldn't rank and I've, uh, that I couldn't rank and I've done this uh, many times for customers. We had a pretty big client base at one point and, that was the approach I took there. Mm -hmm. 
that's the best approach for sure. That's one of the main metrics is that whole, you know, search intent and bounce rates and stuff like that, because you're basically giving Google signals that, you know, that's the, that's the search term people were looking for when they searched for that piece and, and they spent time on that page and they interacted with it versus, you know, clicking on a page and realizing, oh crap, this is like, you know, not what I was looking for and hitting the back button right away. So definitely. Yeah. I, I see we had a uh, Kyle Prinslow join. I, uh, I invited Kyle. We just had a chat today. So Kyle, if you want to jump in, go ahead. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but Kyle is a, an amazing freelancer. We talked SEO in our conversation. So if you have something to throw in, just go ahead and jump in whenever you, you want here. I won't put you on the spot. So let us know. <laughs> hey guys, thank you so much for, for having me. And uh, I'm really enjoying the chat so far. Um, yeah, perhaps I, I um, Maybe I can share like my intro into SEO just for some background. So it started quite a few years ago and it started with a guy named Glenn Alsop from Viper Chill. Dennis, you mentioned uh, Neil Patel and Backlinko and I'm really a big fan of um, their websites and, and how they teach and everything. But Glenn Alsop is really um, solid at the moment and yeah, he was he was my first entry and that sort of led me to doing SEO for my marketing. Uh, I was a marketing manager at this um, e-commerce company and we had various different uh, businesses and brands and all that. And uh, my responsibility was pretty much to get them ranking on Google. <laughs> and um, thankfully that worked out. And then I started doing SEO for my own freelancing uh, business study web development, and then also for my own freelancing clients at the moment. And then that also diversified into rank and rent websites where I would build my own niche websites, rank them, get clients, sell them for a lead on a monthly fee or a once-off fee, or actually sell the whole website. And now, and, and also um, eventually we had our own e-commerce uh, businesses as well, also doing SEO for that. So bottom line is um, I love SEO because it's, free leads, you know, and I still get quite a few leads every single month for my marketing agencies, purely because of SEO. And it's interesting because maybe I can just touch on this point. I know I spoke a lot, but just, just very briefly is, is to say that a lot of people give SEO like a bad rap, like they would say like, um, you know, I don't want to focus on SEO or it's not really for me or it's marketing and, you know, that's not really my thing. But the thing is, think of it this way. If you are creating good quality content, why not just go the extra mile of just learning some SEO fundamentals? You don't have to be a professional because another way to look at it is if you are creating valuable pieces of content, isn't your initial goal for more people to read it? So therefore, why would you not just put more effort into just learning some basic SEO fundamentals? Um, yeah, that's my two cents um, on that. Thanks for, thanks for having me. <laughs> love it. Love it. So Kyle, I wanted to ask you, yeah. and now I want to ask you the same thing. I guess you've kind of addressed your point, but uh, when you first start a project here, what's the main thing you're looking at? Like, how do you build that strategy? Is there some defaults that you go to or do you just, do you just kind of look at a site and change that on a per basis uh, scenario? Like what, what kind of checklist do you run through? What do you prioritize and what are you cleaning up on a site? Uh, yeah. yeah so, so, um, Oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks, Cal. Yeah, so so I have a bit of a process. So typically, um, what I do is I look at some of those metrics that you mentioned, Dennis, like in terms of website performance, first of all, like, you know, page speed and stuff like because, you know, you can have the best SEO strategy in the world. But if you, you know, your website takes like 20 seconds to load. Um, everybody's going to leave, right? So there's, there's no point spending a lot of um, effort on SEO if your foundation isn't set uh, correctly and, and effectively. So I have a bit of a process where we go through more of the kind of like the technical assessment first. Um, we look at a site's um, performance, uh, page speed performance. We look at, um, at some SEO technical uh, uh, um audit we do an seo technical audit first so um, using ahrefs we run a technical audit and we look at any issues that might be you know causing problems from an seo perspective and we fix those those two two things up uh first so you know that's kind of like you know setting the foundation for everything else that needs to be done 
Um, and, you know, once those things are, are, are fixed up, what we do after that is kind of look at, you know, what, what types of things are they trying to rank for? What, what type of competition are they facing in that area? Um, you know, what could they benefit from adding to their website, for example, in terms of features and functionality and so forth, right? We, we have kind of like a standard thing we do for each website that we build. We, we build WordPress websites for that reason as well as because we, we have a framework and, and a, a process that we use for each one of them. Um, and, you know, they, they do really perform well from an SEO perspective as well. They're kind of structured in a way that, you know, Google search engines do like, uh, you know, do like WordPress websites for that reason. And um, and then we go through that and, you know, we apply some of the whatever, you know, uh, improvements can be made and, and we go from there. But the first thing we do is typically, you know, performance and uh, SEO fundamental, like the, the technical things or issues that need to be. Uh, fixed. I like that. I, I guess I didn't approach that one earlier on. That's one of the, the things that I kind of do by default, but you went through the technical audit. So you want to make sure that there's nothing in the site that's going to hold you back before you continue, because you're right. If you're trying to go for backlinks or make sure your bounce rate is good, if you have a slow site, well, those things are going to suffer by default. So you want to make sure you clean before you start building. Yeah, exactly. Awesome insights. How about you, Kyle? Uh, yeah, so so um, I think I think Matt nailed it. Um, my two cents on this is, I think it's important to, you know, get a um, uh, how can I how can I say it like um, figure out the diagnosis. You know, so 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 now it's like uh, what is the pro what what is the problem and now what is the solution? Because the only way I, I mean SEO is very much that way um, uh, strategically, right? I mean you need to first figure out how they are currently doing. And how you can make improvements. So I think, um, um, I mean, what I do is I do a competitive analysis. You know how their competitors are ranking for certain keywords, as as Nat mentioned. You know from a technical this year, but also I think context is important. So for example, if you're competing with, um, like, let's say you've got a client um, who sells car insurance. Obviously, a lot of people type car insurance in on Google, but that is like one of the most competitive. Um, keywords or search terms uh, on the market today versus like, let's say it's like um, plum, plumber in Colorado or like, um, you know, in, uh, like let's say in, in like a different city. So so what I found is that city specific search terms, um, you know, maybe it's like a professional service or product or anything like that, are a lot easier to rank for like these um, more strategic search terms. Um, I mean, more competitive search terms, but that's not also to say that it's not impossible because there are some strategies to focus on long tail key words so i think um, uh, also another approach that i do is uh, the first thing i do is i figure out what are the what are the most um, popular products or categories or services that this business is selling then i would make sure that they are strategic pages almost like landing pages for those high value key services or categories and then i'll make sure that um, uh, that there are highly targeted blog articles uh, talking about that specific, um, you know, product or um, service and all that. And then, and then it's all about the internal links from a technical perspective. And then as Nat mentioned, you know, it's the off page and link, and link building and that whole process, you know. So that's my two cents, my long ones on that. I love that. So competitor analysis and keyword research, I like that you addressed a different part. Definitely a big part of it too. So you want to make sure you, you gauge the the competition, exactly what you can go for, and actually see that keyword potential. And that's something I want to get into too. Maybe we can talk about uh, the keyword tools. So when you're approaching a, a client, you want to know what you can charge them, how difficult this is going to be. So there are different tools like Moz. You can use Google Keyword Planner. And this basically allows you to type in a certain keyword. So imagine a keyword being coffee shop near me in New York City or something like that. And then you can get a general prediction on how much traffic that keyword is actually going to get. And that will help you gauge that, that potential. So I want to try having Gary speak one more time. So uh, he still can't hear us, but I'm going to let him know in Discord that he can talk and we'll see if we can hear him. If not, this will be the last try here. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. I'll mute my mic. 
All right, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me now. Dennis is going to let me know in Discord if you can hear me, but I'm having technical issues. Okay, awesome. You can, you can all hear me. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't been able to hear most of what you, you guys were saying, but I did just want to share real quickly. I my, my attempts at SEO with a recent, well, it's a project from a few years ago. Um, and I know many of you, you know, you're coders, uh, you might be designers, you might have your own blog. Um, and I suggest everybody, you know, if you are a coder, developer, employee or not, or freelancer, just have your own blog so that you can generate traffic and perhaps have like a side income and also generate uh, clients. But anyhow, um, what I did essentially, I, I grew it from zero visitors, of course, to 10,000 visitors a day, almost all from uh, Google in about a year to a year and a half. And there's no way I could have done that without this particular strategy that I implemented. And I really don't think it's black hat. I, I, it might be gray hat. You guys can let me know after I stop talking. Um, but essentially what I did it, in the, the, the content, this is all at Corsetro.com. You guys can go there. Um, it's basically, I just, it was back then Angular was very popular. So I wrote Angular tutorials um, and what I did, I, of course, all the on-site stuff, I made sure to, to dial in. So, you know, all the HTML elements, making sure I'm, I'm using these keywords correctly. What I did is I trolled my daughter. <laughs> I created viral videos. And so here's the strategy. So this is just one of many ways that you can use to try to generate one-way backlinks from authority sites or big websites that Google trusts. Um, so I... I tried to make them loosely related to the content, I, you know, coding and stuff. So what I did is Google Home had just come out and Google Home, I, they, they allowed developers to create voice activated applications. So I, I did a tutorial on how to do that. And the, app, the, the voice app I made was just to trick my daughter, who was like seven at the time, into thinking that I called the cops when she misbehaved. So I got my phone, I recorded it, kind of hit it a little bit and played it. And, and she's sitting, she's standing there getting worried, thinking that the cops are going to come. So it was a fun video. And then what I did is I contacted sites like Huffington Post, Daily Mail. Uh, those were the two main ones. And... I told them, listen, they, they all have submission forms where you can submit your content. I told them, you can use this video I, as long as you link to my website. And so just mention it somewhere in the content. I, and they did it. And I told them the anchor text to use and all that. And so they, they linked directly to the article and the actual homepage. Um, I did this another time. Not sure if uh, Gary's sound cut out. Did yeah, did we lose Gary? I was gonna say, or did, did I freeze? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I guess he cut out. So I guess we'll, we'll wait if he jumps back in. I just, I just DM'd him on Discord. Too bad. It's it was just getting good. Story. <laughs> <laughs> right at the climax of the story. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, okay. I guess I'm gonna try to regroup until Gary comes back or whatever happens here. Got to get get our bearings back here. Yeah, if there's any uh, any topics you wanted to discuss, uh, Nat, if you want to cover something else here, I have a, a whole list that I want to go over. Things like long tail SEO. I see you just posted a, a link. I think that was in the chat or directed to me of an article, maybe content marketing and so on. Uh, I want to bring people up here maybe in a few minutes to start speaking and asking questions. But let's address any topic that that we feel like would be good here. So let's just go ahead and start here. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, one one thing, Dennis, I, I realize probably a lot of people are, you know, like, you know, developers and probably don't have a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of experience with SEO and, you know, might sound a little bit overwhelming. And we're, we might be talking about some fairly like um, advanced topics and whatever today. So I, I don't want people to get overwhelmed. I definitely think, again, there, there are many different areas and niches when it comes to SEO. I always recommend, you know, for web developers to learn, you know, the basics and uh, and start small, right? Like, tr you know, learn, learn the fundamentals. Uh, I posted a, a great website. It's one of the, uh, I, f I forget the lady's name, but uh, she is uh, kind of like a, a very popular person in the SEO community that created that website. And it has a ton of different, a uh, ton of great resources for people that want to learn SEO and 
There's also free resources in my uh, profile, my pinned tweet. There's a bunch of SEO, learn SEO resources. So anyways, long story short, um, check out the resources. There's a lot of free ones that you can, if you want to learn and don't get overwhelmed, like, you know, start small, learn the basics. Like you were saying, Dennis, like go through your HTML, make sure you have all the heading tags, make sure your speed's good, make sure, you know, some of those basic things you would do anyways as a good web developer, uh, build on those things, right? And, and start from there. Yeah. Uh, how about, uh, so I love the, the resources. Let's, let's definitely look into that and make sure that's all linked up. It sounds like you already posted that. Uh, how has your long-term or uh, long-tail SEO strategy been? Have you ever used that? And I'll explain to you, anybody that doesn't understand that have you used that approach at all yeah yeah oh yeah for sure i mean that that i i learned that unfortunately much later and and that's kind of uh, similar to what i was talking about before um i mentioned in one of my tweets before like i i when i started seo i said oh maybe i'll you know i'm, I'm gonna try to rank for calgary web design which is the city where i live in and you know it's a pretty big city um and there's a lot of other companies doing this and I have been doing this for years. So it was kind of like, you know, it's kind of dead in the water, but I didn't even know at that point. I just said, okay, I'm going to do all this technical stuff and make sure that my technical things are good and then I'll rank in no time, right? Well, not not the case. Like I'm still like on the third page or something for that keyword because it's too competitive. It has like, you know, I, I'm like result 20 or something like that. And that's because I wasn't using the correct keywords, those long tail keywords or ones that are more uh, easier to, to uh, like that have less competition. So, so as soon as I changed that strategy... Oh, go ahead. Let, let me just recap what a long term or long tail SEO is or what that strategy is. So this is actually one of the coolest approaches and one of the things that really helped me early on. Long tail SEO is basically the idea of what Nat said, where you have this one keyword. Imagine you're trying to rank for a web developer in your city and it's a big city. That's a hard keyword because there's a lot of people fighting for that. And there's a lot of really good people also fighting for that, meaning web developers usually know SEO. So what you do is you fight for that keyword, but then there's this long tail of related keywords that are very similar to that keyword or can bring in the same type of traffic. So let's say web developer in Montreal brings in uh, 10,000 searches a month, but there is another keyword like web dev or a coffee shop web designer or something like that, a keyword that gets maybe a fraction of that traffic. So what you do is you go through that long list of keywords that are less competitive and you fight for those. And together, those keywords are like 10,000 ants lifting something where they're not as strong as they're on their own, but they help prop up your overall value. And when somebody looks up those niche keywords, you can fight for those because they're not as strong and they'll make your overall strategy better. So now I just wanted to recap that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, uh, definitely. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. So as soon as I realized that and said, okay, Calgary Web Design, you know, I'm not going to rank for that anytime soon. I created a new blog post, which was a little bit more niche and uh, uh, longer tail keywords. So I, I went for choosing a web website design company in Calgary. And the reason I did that, it has lower volume, obviously. But it's like, you know, I, I wrote about the tips of, you know, what you would look for when you're looking to hire uh, a web design company. So more like an informational type of a blog post where I go through things to look for and, you know, what you should look for in a web design company in Calgary and stuff like that. And that one's number one on Google now in my area because and all I did is I kind of restructured it and changed it in a way to you know, meet the search criteria for that particular keyword instead of just uh, web design, cal uh, web design Calgary, right, which is way more competitive. So that that's exactly what you were talking about. And as soon as I changed my approach and started doing things like that, I got way better results. Uh, the other one I have is like WordPress developer Calgary. That one's not as competitive. And that, that one's actually even better for me because I, I only do, we, most of the sites we do are WordPress. So somebody landing on that site is a way better lead for me than somebody landing on web, uh, web design Calgary, for example. Yeah. I love that because what you're doing here is in that waiting time, because SEO takes time. It so could be something that takes a month to, you know, even years to do. So you're kind of giving yourself something to do. Like you make a site, you write some content. What else do you do to make sure that that can rank? And there's different approaches and long tail is one of those things that can, 
keep you busy in that process and slowly just keep chipping away at it while your site's gaining domain authority. It's one of those things that's really powerful. I absolutely love that approach. There's a, a few other ones that I wanted to go over, but before that, I wanted to uh, recap Gary's story so his sound won't work. And he basically said that with that approach and working with those big websites, he got a bunch of one-way backlinks. And I believe he was able to make a video or using that viral video was able to get about 10,000 daily visitors to his site, which I'm assuming ranked his his entire website for you know temporarily or whatever happened there, uh, depending on what Google decides to do with that in the long run. So yeah, that's kind of the end of Gary's story. But uh, along with Long Tail, and uh, if, Kyle, if you want to jump in or Nat, if you want to jump in more, go ahead. Uh, I'm not trying to make this a presentation mode, but I, I also like the idea of of using Google AdWords, if you have a budget or your client has a budget, it's something that I've used in the beginning of my strategy to get clients traffic immediately. And that actually helps SEO. So it's kind of like this approach where we've had this situation where it's like, where we've heard of these situations where you go to a job and you don't have any experience because it's your first job. But then the job says, where the employer says, well, we won't, we don't hire anybody without any experience, but you need experience to, to do something. So it's kind of like that, that weird situation. So when you first get a site, Google is looking for all these metrics like bounce rate and all these links that are on your site and so on. But if you haven't done anything, Google can't really measure those metrics on your website. So what I like to do early on is I like to tell my clients, let's put a small budget aside for Google AdWords and I can get you traffic tomorrow. So that means I go ahead and go to Google AdWords. Uh, I can go to any other websites or different approaches for this. And I start generating traffic immediately. It does cost a little bit more depending on the ind industry and how you bid for it. But that was also another approach that I found that got the traffic immediately, but actually helped the launch from SEO because now Google can start getting those stats immediately. So I can launch a site tomorrow and I can have ads running for it. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, maybe if, if the AdWord process uh, approves it, because sometimes that can take a couple hours to maybe a couple of days. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. It's a great strategy. Kyle, you go ahead. Sorry, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, um, I was just going to like um, reiterate what you guys said. Um, and also on the AdWords side, uh, AdWords and SEO definitely go uh, really well hand in hand. But um, I, I just wanted to touch on the long tail side, um, just maybe also um, uh, explain it for those who are still a little bit confused. So um, in general, a long tail keyword is around three to six words. This is just plus minus. And some examples are something like um, best dentist in X city. Like um, instead of saying dining furniture, maybe you can be more niched or specific to say something like modern dining dining furniture or um, modern wooden dining furniture. You know, you know so just more descriptive um, basically. And then when it comes to like freelancers, and I was just thinking about you, Nat, so I actually just did a quick Google search. So, for example, I think a good article for you would be something like uh, website design tips for Calgary business owners. I would uh, try and nail, nail down on that. And then um, one thing that I like doing to figure out from an SEO perspective, just for my own um, things as well as for clients and everything, is whatever the main search term is, I would type it in on Google and then I would hit the space bar. And usually you will see auto suggestions on different searches underneath which Google will suggest. So those are additional uh, search terms that you could potentially rank for. So for example, in the case of UNAT, if you were to type in something like website design Calgary, yes, you don't see any auto suggestions, but the moment you hit enter, go to the bottom of the page and you will see various different other uh, keywords and, and searches. So so one that stands out to me that I think uh, you could write is website design Calgary price. Just by adding the price in and talking about that quotes and all that type of stuff. So um, I hope this little tip um, helps help some of the listeners. Oh man, Kyle, what you just said is absolutely golden. Like I, I don't want to reiterate it because I'm just going to be repeating everything, but wow. Uh, that is the way you just, you, you, touched up on the long tail keywords. I love that that approach of just going to Google because that's one that I've always used too, where you just look at that auto suggestion. So on that point and going for those low level keywords that can help you still fight for the top spots, uh, what are some keyword tools that you all have used? Because I'm a little bit old school. I haven't done SEO 
in almost two years for a client. Uh, I just picked one up recently for the first time because I had some extra time on my hands. But I'm still on Google Keyword Tools. Kyle, I know you mentioned one, or a Google Keyword Research or Keyword Planner. And uh, I've also used Moz for this. So Moz will actually, that's M-O-Z, uh, that'll actually give you those suggested keywords based off of any keyword you put in. And it'll not only show you the suggest suggested keywords, but it'll actually show you the potential traffic to that in whatever perimeter or radius that you set that. Yeah, there's uh, there's quite a few like free uh, keyword research. They're called keyword research tools um, that people can use definitely to, to kind of get ideas, you know, and, and they'll give you uh, information regarding difficulty and things like that as well. And like Kyle said, Kyle, by the way, thanks for your suggestions for, uh, I have some of those too, the prices and stuff, but thanks for your keyword suggestions. That's awesome as well for my website, but definitely, you know, there's quite a few free resources. So I, I posted a tweet a few days ago. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll reply to your spaces with, with that as well, uh, regarding some free keyword research tools, um, Personally, I use uh, Ahrefs, but I have a paid license. I know it's a little bit um, out of reach for new people. Probably, you know, SEO tools are uh, expensive. So, you know, there are a lot of free options available as well if you want to do keyword research. So I'll post that in the, in the, in, in your, uh, like as a response to your tweet as well, Dennis. Oh, awesome. Sweet. I'm, yeah, it definitely I'm hoping tools. also... I also want to, hopefully we could bring up Jeremy because he's the expert here. Like he runs an SEO agency. That's pretty, pretty huge. Sure. So, Jeremy, if you um, want to request, I'll, I'll add you here. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. He's my expert. Him and Mustafa, they're my, they're my experts when it comes to uh, SEO for sure. Awesome. Uh, another topic I wanted to go over, uh, we have Simon in the, in the audience right now. So I want to go over this story. Uh, there's also the content marketing approach. So this is where, uh, where we kind of talked about the long tail strategy where you're creating content based off of what your industry is. And I actually had somebody ask for a content marketing strategy and it was perfect timing because Simon who runs uh, the company feed hive, which I believe is like a, a platform for posting on social networks. I actually haven't used it, but I saw him post something and he also posted a ranking result to one of his keywords. So what Simon is doing is he's bringing traffic to his website for free by simply writing articles on questions that people have. So he elaborated on it. I'm hoping I can find it here. I might bring it up in a second, but he got this article and now Feedhive is not just ranking well for certain terms, but they're pulling free traffic because of that article. So he's kind of going through this uh, lead funnel. So I absolutely love the approach. And, and that's one of the amazing strategies and how you can actually use, I guess, free free traffic, even though it's not free because you're working for it, but generate free traffic yeah. to your website. It's an absolutely amazing approach. I want to find that article and, and or that post and actually link it up because uh, he played that out perfectly. And that's exactly how you're supposed to do that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I looked at Simon's site. I was helping him out with some stuff not too long. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, but we were taking a look at his site and yeah, they they got like great results by doing exactly that. You know, writing some great articles that you know just got picked up, and you know their domain authority is already like super high, and you know it's yeah. not a not a you know it's a fairly new company. So it goes to show you how powerful that is. I see. Uh, you also made Jeremy the speaker. Maybe we can get him to introduce himself. Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me on. Sorry, I'm jumping in super late. I uh, got a, a few minutes here to spare, but uh, yeah, my name is Jeremy Moser. Um, I'm a co-founder and CEO at Usurp, and we do SEO and digital PR for mostly SaaS and software companies. Uh, so some of our clients, for example, are like Monday.com, Robinhood, Freshworks. Um, so mostly working in like the high tech and software spaces. Um, and we do a big focus on link building, backlinks, digital PR, um, this is kind of our bread and butter focus. Um, so I don't know if there was anything specific you wanted me to, to talk about or if you just wanted to like ask questions or I can jump in on any particular topic. Uh, but yeah, feel free to, to let me know. It's perfect, Jeremy, because actually when we started the chat, we were talking about backlinks and somebody posted in Dennis's original tweet that, you know, backlinks are kind of like not useful. Mm. Um, and so how, 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 um, 
How important of a metric do you think backlinks are for SEO? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a complicated answer, but backlinks are definitely one of the top ranking factors, and they have been for a long time, and I see them uh, being that in the foreseeable future as well. Um, if you look at a recent tweet from John Mueller of Google, um, he essentially touched on this topic a little bit more in detail and then kind of compared it to technical SEO overall, saying essentially that in almost, you know, in, in most cases, backlinks from really good sources. So we're talking about really high quality sites, not low quality links. If you're getting them from like, you know, someone on Fiverr or if you're, you know, paying a webmaster 25 bucks for a link, those are usually things you want to avoid. I'm uh, more so speaking about links that you're acquiring from like, you know, if you were getting mentioned editorially by HubSpot or like crunchbase.com or g2.com or something like really authoritative in your space, then those are really high quality links that are going to boost rankings just overall on your site. Um, and so going back to what John Mueller from Google said about this, essentially for most businesses, a lot of the times getting these high quality links is more important than technical SEO. Obviously you want to have a really good foundation on your site. You want everything to be running smoothly and, and fast, but Acquiring these links is really important just overall for your authority and, and building rankings. Thank you for uh, elaborating on the on the quality of link. That's one thing mm -hmm. I, I can't specify or can't stress enough because that's always my fear. People hear backlinks and they just say, I can get as many as possible. I'll go buy them and you're going to do yourself a disservice and then spend more time trying to fix your site with Google than actually do good for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the biggest distinction there is is quality over quantity. And obviously, if you can get a quantity of quality, then that's the, the best of both worlds. But what you really want to focus on is acquiring links from as high quality sources as you can. So generally, that means going into a tool like Ahrefs or maybe you don't have that, maybe like SEMrush or Moz or anything like that and kind of setting a minimum authority score anywhere from like you know, 40 to 50 is kind of the baseline you want to target there. That usually gives you a good idea. Of this is an established brand. They probably have a good amount of content on their site that's, you know, niche relevant. It's probably already picking up some rankings. Um, and that's usually a good indication of a pretty high quality site from a minimum standpoint. Um, and then just anything that's really niche and topical relevance in your space that, you know, you'd recognize on a daily basis. For example, like if you're in software, getting a mention like editorially on a crunch based blog would be huge for you because that's one of the most niche relevant publications there is in like the startup space. So you really want to just refine your list and, and kind of move away from the idea that, you know, I need to acquire hundreds of links from anywhere I can to get good rankings on this one given piece or just authority to my site overall and really shift your mindset towards, okay, here's, you know, maybe 20, 30 sites that are really good in my niche. And if I can get links from these sites, pointing to a specific page on my site, whether that's a blog post or the homepage, I'm going to almost always increase my ranking for that page, depending on the competition that you're facing there. So can you talk about a link building strategy? Because this approach can be done in so many different ways, but I'm curious on some of the methods you've used, if you don't mind sharing this information, like how would you reach out to, to a, a bigger company? Let's say they have a good domain authority. Let's say this is the New York times or something, and you're trying to get a backlink. What's an approach that people can practice here? Maybe also not go for such a high backlink if you're just starting out. Yep, that's a great question. So I'd say for targeting anything like a tier one media source, so like the New York Times or like Huffington Post, uh, TechCrunch for that matter, anything like this, um, I'd honestly avoid at least in the early stages if you're, if you're still kind of struggling to get links. Uh, these sites are just hammered every day with thousands of emails for, for people trying to prospect links. Um, they're also a little more sketched out to the idea of backlinks, even though they shouldn't be. Um, so these sites often almost always no follow your links. So they're going to pass a little bit less link equity. Um, there's still definitely a lot of value in acquiring no follow links, but I would honestly avoid some of these sites, at least in the short term and build a little bit more of a niche list to start. And then from there, I'd focus on a few different modalities. Uh, so one of the main ones being just really connecting with journalists and bloggers that uh, may, may have editorial access to those given sites. So whether that's the actual owner of the software company, for example, uh, Simon in here, like he, he runs FeedHive. If, if someone wanted to submit a piece to his site as like a guest contribution or potentially add a resource link to one of his existing blog posts, building a real relationship with him and, and kind of getting to know him and obviously building a friendship there 
is really key in link building for the long term. It's, it's really all about relationships because you can cold pitch as much as you want. Uh, but there's just so many other people doing the same thing as you, providing the same exact uh, value as you, trying to get a guest post. Uh, people are just getting hammered on a daily basis in the email inbox. So really focusing on a relationship aspect there as what at least has been key for us. So it sounds like, yeah, outreach, relationship building, and you're usually wanting to to offer something. So just for some ideas uh, for people out there, uh, a guest post is one thing you can do where if you are offering some valuable content, you have a good take on something. Uh, when you're providing this kind of information to somebody, they're more than willing to to allow you to link to yourself if you're adding value to their site. So I personally feel like when you're link building, the value you're bringing to somebody should be more than what they're giving you, uh, because you're the one you're the one doing the ask. You definitely need to make sure you're actually adding something as opposed to saying, "Hey, please link to my site and figure something out from there." Yeah, absolutely. And one one kind of actionable tip I can leave you with for at least for the guest posting side is when you're reaching out to a given site spend a little bit of time and, and take a look at what they've already published on their blog and, and take a look at also the competitors in the space. Um, so you can use, again, a tool like Ahrefs is what I primarily use for this, and you can do what's called a content gap analysis. So essentially looking at specific keywords that the given site you're hoping to get a guest post on is covering compared to competitors in the space. Um, and that'll give you an idea of, okay, they're, they're lacking content on these five or six subjects, whereas competitors are ranking pretty well for these. So that's immediate value that you can then pitch to that given site and say, hey, you know, I, I did a research here and I found these five or six topics that competitors are outranking you for. Uh, I believe I can create a really good piece of content and deliver that to you that will pick up rankings for this. So that's an immediate way where you can kind of get your foot in the door. Man, I love this information. I don't, I don't even do this that often anymore, but this gets me excited. <laughs> So I'll, uh, I'll allow uh, anybody who wants to request to speak. So we'll just keep going, but I'll start approving people. If you have any questions or wanted to say something, uh, go ahead and request and we'll start taking audience interactions here. Uh, Dennis, um, perhaps I could just add on to what Jeremy said because Jeremy was nailing it. And one strategy that I've tried um, besides um, what Jeremy mentioned is uh, um, I think – I read it from a guy named um, uh, Brian Dean, which you mentioned earlier, Backlinker, and it's that 404 broken link outreach strategy. So yes, I do agree that um, people's um, inbox are getting spammed and crazy just about like, I mean, even my own personal one about every, I mean, every almost every day there's like, um, please link to this and all that stuff. And, and uh, the truth is, it's not going to happen. But a strategy that does work is if you have to take that person's website and you put it in a broken link or broken URL checker and you try and find broken links on their website. And let's say, hopefully, you've got a piece of content that what you do is you send an email to say, like, hey, uh, just notice that you've got a 404 on this page. Notice that this link that you link out to is broken. If you would not mind, here's my, you know, article, here's my page, uh, also a great resource, you know, if, um, you know, if you'd like to replace it, you know. Um, so, so it's a really simple thing and obviously it takes a lot of uh, time and effort, but really it's worth it. And I've personally been quite successful um, in that regard. So, yeah, that's my two cents on that. Awesome strategy, too, and you're providing value in that process. Uh, Abdul, I see we have uh, you in the chat. You can speak. Uh, looks yeah. like your mic is ready to go. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my question is with regards to um, social signals. What are their impacts um, with um, today's SEO? Like, what do they bring on board? Thank you. So, what are the impacts of social signals? If anyone wants to jump on this one. So. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just jump with my approach. That's been always a, a big part of my strategy uh, when it comes to car content marketing, generating that social signals depending on the type of site, whether that's a local business, uh, just making sure that I'm indexed correctly, that my site is posted in places like Yelp or any of these other platforms, and just making sure that I'm active on social networks that has had a huge impact. Nat, it looks like you had something to say on this. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Maybe there was a bit of a delay, too. Um, Dennis, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah we can hear now. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I actually just posted a tweet about this this morning. I mean, um, you know, the, I mean, you know, nobody, nobody really knows 
like the, the Google algorithm in terms of how it weighs certain, you know, signals like backlinks or whatever, or social shares or whatever of your content. So it really depends um, in terms of, um, you know, how, how valuable social shares are, for example, for your content. But everything that I've kind of read does mention that, you know, having your content shared on different social media platforms uh, does, you know, kind of send some sort of a signal to Google that it's that it's valuable because it's getting shared a lot. Um, however, I don't know how, how big of an impact that is. What has a bigger impact is actually if you're, um, you know, sharing your content uh, on social media and people are opening it and looking at it, um, you know, that will drive a lot of traffic to your website. So, for example, for me, ever since I've, you know, joined Twitter and started getting active, you know, like 60 or 70 percent of my traffic comes from Twitter, actually, but people clicking on my profile and then going into my website, for example. So, I mean, there's that, you know, it's it's an, it's another sound strategy for sure that you can use to drive more traffic to your website. So it's a great question, Abdul. That's a that's a really interesting point with a. Uh with that social signals and I guess is with how Google works, no one really knows. I guess when I say Google, I'm talking all search engines. They don't actually show exactly how they're going to rank everything. So there's really no way to understand it. But from my personal results, I had a client that was dead in the water. I couldn't figure out anything for their strategy. And uh, we ended up starting a YouTube channel. Now we did link back and forth to the site, but I don't think that was that big of a value. But I feel like if I were building a search engine like that, I would use some kind of strategy to, be able to correlate the YouTube name along with that website. I feel like that has to have some kind of impact and I couldn't imagine that they don't do that, but simply creating a YouTube channel that was getting at the time, it was like just a couple thousand views. It wasn't anything big, but none of their competitors were getting those views. So I feel like Google can correlate that and actually make the connection. And from my personal experience, it's helped a lot. So that's probably my only experience where just purely the social signal had an effect on it, at least that I can measure So it looks like we have a few more people. Abdul, I think that was uh, for your question. Uh, we have, trying to see the name here. Is that Kushi or do you want to make, make sure I'm saying that right? Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dennis. My question is for Jeremy and it could be a little out of sync. My question is, is with regards to copywriting. Uh, I wanted to know how uh, do Jeremy visualize a deliverable for website copywriting like apart from basic english and punchy lines what do an ideal website copy should have like a perfect website copy yeah that's a good question um i think what, where you really want to start from is is basically speaking to obviously whatever client you're potentially working with and getting a little bit of an understanding on their business background um, so really just understanding the business from start to finish is going to help you visualize things a little bit better and, and understanding how things work beyond the basic level of, you know, okay, this is a software tool that exports, you know, X to Z or, or something like that. You want to really understand how the users are actually utilizing that software. Um, so that can come into play by speaking to the uh, client in general or even potentially interviewing any customers if you have access to them. Um, that's usually a really good place to start. And if you can't get that access, if it's already already an existing tool that you know maybe has a good user base, potentially looking at any reviews just to see what people like, what they don't like, what the main use case for that tool is, is a really good place to start. And that'll help you understand kind of how you can craft at least the hero section of, of a landing page or a homepage. Um, so that's basically the starting point that you want to focus on is that hero section and really nailing uh, your headline, your subheader, your call to action, adding a little bit of social proof in that headline just to keep things moving, um, and then focusing your landing page essentially on one call to action. So what's the one step that you want people to take, whether that's maybe a free trial or it's converting right away, like if you don't offer a free trial, for example. Um, but I think really nailing your focus on the overall usage of that tool is going to help you write copy for that landing page. Uh, far easier than it would be if you're kind of just making things up as you go, as well as just kind of taking the super basic use case for it. Um, so that's how I at least approach starting points for that. And then moving down the page, really just showcasing uh, a little bit of a deeper dive into, you know, the features and the benefits. So a lot of people do focus um, a little heavily on benefits. Like you might land on a landing page and 
Uh, the headline is super abstract and you have no idea what it does. Uh, it's really focused on like, you know, maybe it says like, we help you make more money or something super broad. Um, but I think really drilling down into the features and the benefits combined is, is a really good approach that I like to take. Hopefully that, uh, that answered the question. I know it was kind of a long winded answer. Yeah, thank you. And one more thing, I'm like the backlink thing also uh, works here. I mean, we have to take care of the backlink and everything that was discussed um, on this regards also. Sorry, what was the question there? Uh, I just wanted to know the, uh, also the importance of maintaining the SEO balance while writing the same, the copy. So I, th I think it was to do with backlinks and, and the copy of the content, like linking those two together. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, Jeremy, I guess, oh yeah, you can elaborate better on this, but I, I think those those two go hand in hand. I mean, that's the whole outreach strategy when when your copy is good after, you know, besides the technicals and the structure, that's exactly where the link building strategy comes in. Uh, once you have the copy, if it's actually good, there's going to be people wanting to link to this resource and that just goes hand in hand. The better that content's going to be, the more likely you're going to get those links and potentially high quality backlinks. Okay. Yeah, and then thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think to add to that, just, I, I got to jet out in a sec here, but one final thing to add there is, if you can add any sort of supporting research or information in your copy, it's a really good way to generate even more links. So even if you have just kind of a basic landing page or a homepage and you're trying to build some more branded homepage links, adding any sort of data that you can to that homepage is a really great way to generate links. So for example, if you're uh, in like the healthcare space or something like that, and you add any sort of you know unique or custom data, like 50% of people need help with you know, XYZ healthcare situation. Uh, that's a really great way to build a reference point on your homepage and something that, you know, another person who's writing a blog post can link back to. Um, it's just a really valuable way to essentially increase the amount of links that you're getting for a difficult page by essentially including referenceable data that, that people might be using. Um, so thank you guys for having me, but I got to jet out and it was uh, nice chatting with everyone. Yeah, thank you for stopping by, Jeremy. I really appreciate that. You gave amazing information. Oh, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, have a good one, everyone. See ya. All right, you, you too. All right, so we have Mustafa here. Um, I had to mute your mic because it was unmuted. If you can try to change that and ask your question. Uh, if anybody else has a question, go ahead and uh, request to speak, and we'll add you. Yeah, um, so uh, can I speak? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Hey, cool. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I just wanted to kind of add to, uh, first of all, I have, you know, hi to everyone here. Um, you know, I, I see Nat, uh, uh, I think Jeremy just left. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So going back to, um, uh, the whole outreach thing for, you know, for links, um, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, they're so, in a hurry to get a, get a link that they they forget um, the importance of um, you know building uh, building a relationship uh, with with uh, the person that you want to get a, get the backlink from, especially when the backlink uh, is supposed to come from a really valuable uh, you know site or a blog. So um, you know this is uh, what I I feel uh, is a smart thing to do. Uh, you know, when you're trying to uh, reach out to someone for a backlink is that when you, when you first, uh, you know, when you have a list of all these people that you want to reach out to, you know, uh, you know, 99% of the, of the time you, you find, um, you know, people asking for the link uh, right in the first email, you know, so instead of doing that, uh, you know, this is what I feel you should do. Uh, when you first reach out to them, you know, make the email about about them in every way. You know, find out anything about them that uh, that is uh, gonna make them sit up and take notice of you. I mean, you know, be interested in them uh, so that you know they actually don't feel like they're being pitched or you know 
uh, in and being taken advantage of or anything you know uh, you want them to um, you know see you as someone who's genuinely uh, you know interested in what they're doing because obviously if you're reaching out to them there's there has to be you know there has to be something good about their site that you like you know, talk about that it don't have to make the email too long you don't have to, to uh, you know uh, write a lot of lot of uh, stuff that is not relevant to the to the to, to the whole conversation but you can definitely talk good about them in the first email and then just leave it at that there, don't ask any questions uh, don't pitch anything uh just genuine appreciation of whatever they're doing right and then uh like i i i i have done a lot of cold emailing in the past few years and you know you know what happens is uh 50 to 70 percent of the time if you if your approach is really genuine you are gonna get back an email from them saying thanks i mean and you know a lot of people will say you know like nobody, nobody actually reaches out, out out to us in such a genuine manner where, where they're actually uh, talking about us. Uh, you know, people are always pitching me, or people are always after getting something from me. And you're the only, you're the first person to, you know, actually uh, appreciate my work and stuff. When that happens, it's you know you've already started a conversation, and and then in your next email you can just say no problem it's okay i mean i hope to stay connected with you and stuff and then that uh you know those two three emails have uh you know helps you build this start this new relationship and then when you reach out to them like a week later or a, or a few weeks later uh saying hey what's up by the way i just noticed that you know uh there's an opportunity for you to link to my site uh, you know, here or even if there is no place to link, you could just, they, you know, could you find a place, relevant place on your in, in this article for to link to my site and stuff? And then, since they already know you, and then they they, they know that you're not, you know, you're not someone new, uh, the chances of them giving you that link are gonna be pretty damn high when you compare that to someone who's just uh, cold emailing them uh, to get that link in the first email. So, I mean, I feel relationships. Uh, building, uh, not just, I mean, building a relationship takes time, but even starting a new relationship, you know, it can make a, a huge difference to the kind of response uh, you get to your cold emails. Yeah, so so that's that's what I wanted to add to Jeremy's, yeah. Point. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, this is why link building is probably the trickiest part for a lot of people because it's not a technical, it's not like you can just update your your, you know, your title tags, your metal tags on the website, and that's it. Like it's a, it's a moving target, and it's a non-technical process. So, absolutely right. Uh, Nat and Kyle, I know we're at an hour and twelve minutes from when we said we we're going to start. Let me know if you guys are short on time. I don't want to hold you guys. Just give you the out, so you guys can uh, take off if you need. Yeah, no, I'm good. Okay, awesome, awesome. I'm good. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like we have a Natalie here, or <laughs> Natalie Madison. Sorry about that. <laughs> I read a different name and got mixed up. Uh, Madison, if you have a question, um, a few more people who requested to speak. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I was just wondering if you guys had any recommendations for small businesses looking to identify those keywords because, like, I know sites like Simrush can have a pretty hefty price tag. And so I was wondering if y'all had any suggestions or tips. Yeah, so uh, Kyle addressed that point just using Google, just typing in a keyword like your business industry and then just hitting space in Google. That's a nice free way to do that. Uh, Google Keyword Planner, I use that all the time. You go to Google Keyword Planner, you type in a keyword, they can suggest keywords for you, tell you the traffic. Uh, these are free tools. There's quite a bit of them out there, but uh, those are the two methods that I would recommend if you just want to get started right away. And those will yeah. allow you to to set this perimeter in a certain radius to your business and get very targeted. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, sure. Sorry. So, so, so to add on to what uh, Dennis said, one hundred percent. The the three tools that I'm using at the moment that are awesome because I do agree with you, Madison, SEMrush and Ahrefs and all, all of that stuff. I mean, it's actually so expensive. And the tools that I use at the moment are Uber Suggest. You can get started for free, and I use that very often to generate content ideas. But the other two tools that I'm using uh, mostly at the moment is called Rank Tracker, 
and Nozzle. And the awesome thing is if you have to just type in Rank Tracker AppSumo or Nozzle AppSumo, I think it's on like a lifetime deal of like $50 or $60 once off. And you get access to like these awesome SEO tools, pretty much almost similar to SEMrush and uh, Hrefs and all that type of stuff. The one thing I did want to ask you though is, is when you say SEO for small businesses, can you elaborate on that? Are you asking from a freelancing perspective or are you asking for a specific business? Because if you can give us a use case, I'm sure we can brainstorm some SEO strategies for you. Yes. So it is kind of a freelance situation, but the small business is an online um, clothing boutique that is new and they're um, working on creating their like mission statement, their content pillars, and they eventually, you know, want to include blogs to increase their SEO and link back to their website. Okay, cool. Okay. My next question is what type of clothing, because obviously, uh, Boutique clothing is quite broad these days. Uh, Can you elaborate on that? Oh, yes. So this would be like clothing for young women. I would say the like 18 to 30 range, Um, probably more of the going out. Like, you know, it's not really like athletic wear, if that makes sense. Cool. Cool. Okay, so I don't want to hog the conversation because I'm sure we can go um, uh, back and forth, but I, I, maybe I can just throw, uh, throw a few um, examples out and, and scenarios and all that. So first things first, um, when it comes to SEO, um, obviously um, when you're dealing with any type of business, SEO is an avenue to get clients. Obviously there are many ways. So I would look at an holistic approach of getting clients such as, you know, the website, Instagram, Pinterest, um, you know, um, pretty much anything where, where the ideal target audience is. And it sounds like it's, I mean, as you mentioned, it's young women are the target audience and most of them are generally on Instagram, Pinterest, um, TikTok and, and all that type of stuff. So the other one is obviously you want to niche down your content because let's face it, boutique, fashion, online clothing, all that type of stuff, it is incredibly competitive. So now you need to think, okay, what, how can I use long tail keywords, which we mentioned earlier, about how to stand out and differentiate, you know, um, this little boutique store. And again, as I say, I mean, you, you don't even necessarily need SEO. Sometimes uh, social media is just, I mean, good enough if you're more strategic on that side. But just from an SEO perspective, maybe they've got, let's say, cocktail dresses, like let's say black cocktail dresses, or let's say elegant um, feminine dresses. I don't know. I mean, obviously you can niche down. You mentioned it's just not sportswear and all that type of stuff. So then what I would do is I'll create targeted landing pages on that um, you know, product or category. I would create a lot of Facebook ads, retargeting on Insta- on Instagram, Pinterest, and I would also create an email list, you know, to get people on the email list so that you can give, um, you know, monthly um, promotions, um, update them of any new content. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I don't want to ramble the, uh, hog the conversation here, but that's just my two cents for that. Yeah, Kyle, what, what, are, yeah. What, what Kyle just said is perfect. You're absolutely right. So not to discourage you, Madison, but that's going to be, uh, definitely a tougher keyword because you're not dealing with a local ranking site. You're dealing with something that's more on a national level that people shop with diff- differently or shop for differently. And you're going to definitely have to bring in different approaches. Now, uh, outside of the marketing methods that Kyle mentioned, I like to look where places look in places where people are not actually looking as far as competitors. So uh, search engines aren't just Google. You can also try YouTube here if you're willing to go that, that route, uh, whether that's Instagram, uh, they have a, not the stories, but what are those, uh, the long, longer term videos. Those are also search engines in their own, or they have those, those search engines. So if you use that approach and maybe try to create content around that specifically on YouTube, that's been a method that, I, that I've actually used where I find the main keyword, like women's clothing in a specific you know, niche right there. That might be so hard to rank inside of the SEO strategy where I would just add that as a method, let that rank, do the content marketing, use the social networks and emails, but maybe try something like YouTube with that too, because uh, ranking for that word may not be hard because there's a higher cost to entry there. When you're making a YouTube video, that might be production. So people are less likely to compete with you there and therefore allowing you to 
uh, to rank for that faster. And even if someone is competing with you, uh, I actually have a YouTube channel and most of my views come from suggested videos. So even if one of your competitors has a video on that topic, let's say you're displaying clothes or maybe putting together outfits, uh, there's a chance that your video will come up in the suggestions where on Google that won't happen. You either are in the results or you're not. So no website's going to recommend you where YouTube yeah. will actually allow that. So think of SEO as a whole approach besides just the search engines. Thank you. That yeah, was very I, helpful. I think that's a, it's an awesome, just want to add one more thing. And, and then it's an awesome idea because, I mean, YouTube's the second biggest search engine after Google, right? So it's especially if some yep. of those keywords aren't tapped into, like it's a great opportunity. Um, uh, what Kyle mentioned as well is the, the Uber Suggest is free. It's a great tool if, if you don't have any paid SEO tools. What I do typically if I'm stuck if or if I'm working with a new client and I need some ideas is I, um, I type in, like I ask them what their competitors are, and then I type in their URL into Uber Suggest, and then I get content ideas based on things that they might be uh, ranking for or doing. So that's another approach you can take where it can give you, you know, if you're stuck and you're not sure kind of like what ideas to pursue, that's another way. Just type in a competitor link. You'll see their kind of, uh, you know, popular content and there might be some opportunities there or it might give you ideas on, you know, what types of content you can you can target in order to uh, to add to your own website. Great question. So it looks like a, a Abdul has another question. Danny, I had no idea you were in the SEO game, so I do want to uh, pick your brain in a minute here, but let's uh, let's have Abdul ask another question. And then if anybody else has questions, just want to keep reminding people, go ahead and request and we'll bring you up to speak. Okay. I just uh, get Danny into joining my space because he joins every space and he didn't join mine. So I just posted that and then here he is and I'm glad. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Um... I have a thing, uh, two questions to ask. Um, the first one is with um, Uncle, uh, Uncle Tex, with, with regards to link building. Like, um, how do you um, guys approach that when you're building links? How important is your keyword to the Uncle Tex that you use um, when you are doing link building? Um, the other one to you is with regards to um, GMB, Google My Business. How do you, like, what, what are the strategies that you guys use um, when um, you are setting up a business page on Google My Business? And how do you approach um, the daily um, ins and outs of that? Also, um, I would like to add um, Keywords Everywhere uh, Chrome um, extension is, is one great tool that um, can help one to um, discover um, long tail keywords um, that are doing well. Just as um, Carl suggested for the listing, the Google search uh, option is also one way to that one can utilize. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Abdul. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in, and you guys, you guys fill fill in for sure. Uh, if you have other experiences, I think for the anchor anchor text, you want to be careful uh, with that because Google doesn't like that actually. Like especially if it's a, a you know, keyword you're trying to rank for that's competitive. So I'll give you, I'll give you that example, like that I was using earlier, Calgary Web Design. You know, if I start spamming that anchor everywhere and sending links using that anchor to my website, um, it's pretty obvious for Google to pick up on that that I'm trying to game the system. So what they like more is natural links. So typically, natural links are going to be links to your URL or something like you know, Clio. Check out Clio websites or something like that. That's more natural. Um, but again, like nobody really knows how the algorithm works exactly, but be careful if you are doing b link building, not to, not to use those like money keywords, they call them money keywords where, you know, it's like Calgary web design is every, is an anchor text for every page you're building links for. So that's, that's a bit of a, uh, that's a bit of a no, no. And then the other one, um, that, that you mentioned is Google, my business, that's a must have for any local business. Um, Google My Business is, you know, like I get a ton of traffic through my profile. Uh, again, uh, a key part about having a Google Business account is um, having a, a, a an actual location uh, really helps and having reviews actually really helps. So in short, 
you know, if you're if you're pursuing Google My Business, which is a great strategy, and I recommend it again for every local business, make sure it's a, as complete as possible. Make sure you're, you know, posting content on Google My Business. Make sure you have all the fields um, filled out. Make sure you get as many reviews as possible. So, like, really focus on 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 having a good Google My Business profile because that'll go a long way as well in terms of uh, in terms of getting local traffic. Yeah, it's funny. We never uh, we didn't mention the reviews just because we're talking about SEO in a, in a bigger context here. But uh, absolutely huge ranking factor. If you have a local business, you have a physical address. Uh, reviews on Google Business, uh, on Yelp, any other platform like that. Get those reviews. Those uh, again, we don't know how Google works, but I've seen those have a direct impact and a huge impact, not just in conversion, but in how Google will actually see your platform. Just want yeah, to touch on that point. If I can add to what you mentioned, Nat and and Dennis, um, uh, Abdul, yes. Um, so w- when it comes to link building, I also just want to reiterate because a lot of the focus is always on, um, you know, external links linking to you. Which yes, that's correct. But also, I want to um, also mention that internal links is also, I mean, also very important. So. Uh, linking to important pages with on your website and also linking to other important uh, publications or websites. Um, so, for example, I would very often link to, uh, or, or let me put it this way, whatever try, whatever search term I'm trying to rank for, I would type that in on Google and I would make sure that I'm also linking to some of those pages because obviously Google sees them as an authority. So if they see them as authority, chances are, um, you know, they will eventually see me as like, let's say, among the peers of the of those websites, because I'm also linking out to them. So let me give you a quick example. Um, in, 26, in 2016, I used to sell uh, parrot cages. <laughs> I know it's uh, super niche and all that stuff, but but uh, uh, very important. I didn't just try and get, um, you know, like random uh, links know authority websites or anything yes i did get those but what's more important was i wanted to get links from let's say uh, bird uh, bird websites or bird blogs or pet websites you know so you just need to try and find links within your niche same thing with um, if you're a web design freelance or something get links from other uh, you know web development platforms or let's say your local publications and and things like that so at least that can um, you know help as a balance obviously content is important the other thing i just wanted to quickly touch on is google my business so uh, um, i I do feel a bit bad because uh, in this niche that i'm in i'm in the medical niche and and my clients are like i'm trying to say this you know i I mean this in in like without being prideful but they're but they are like dominating (laughs) And, and 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 the reason for that is Let's say, let's say for example, um, I, I'm I'm in the dentist niche, right? And I've got a client like dentist uh, in New York. I wouldn't I wouldn't say doctor so and so, you know, as the business. I would say dentist New York. So the main type of keyword for that city, that's what I would try and focus on to niche down. So that's number one. The other one, which which makes it seem, uh, which dominates it even more, is getting as Dennis, as Dennis and Nat mentioned, is the actual reviews. So what you want to do is you want to encourage and incentivize customer or patient or client reviews. And the way that we do that, at least, is to, uh, on a weekly or monthly basis, um, depending on what it is, but let's say in a monthly basis, we will get all the clients or all the patients, send them a once-off email and say, okay, we really appreciate your reviews. You know, it really makes a, uh, you know, a difference in just being honest and transparent with them. And that has helped rank number one on Google Maps and number one on Google in the search results. So it's dominating. And it's quite bad because the second guy on um, you know Google Maps has like eight reviews. We've got like ninety-two. <laughs> so, so so obviously there's a big um, difference, and it makes it stand out even more. So that's my, so that's my two cents on that. Yeah, I like the review approach. There's a lot of strategies there. Um, I actually had a, a medical office. I forgot what the what exactly they did or what their specialty was, but uh, I got them to put in an iPad at their front desk there was a QR code and also uh, basically the option to link to your Google business or whatever platform we decided to work with that day. And we would just get a couple of reviews, probably two, three, two or three reviews every single day, just from people in that office, because you're talking about hundreds of people uh, going through there and just teaching their front desk to interact with people and mention that. So that's uh, as far as a strategy that you're looking for, that can be used at coffee shops, 
maybe with gift cards, you never want to pay for reviews or incentivize people with a reward. You just want to encourage them and get them to kind of see it. Uh, Abdul, I'm not sure if we answered your question. I know you had a multi-part question, but kind of went on a side tangent, but you just uh, ignited our <laughs> conversation for the reviews because that was a big thing. I see we have Jeremy back too. So Jeremy, good to have you back. I don't know if you uh, what your time schedule is like, but feel free to chime in whenever. Uh, we have another question from Mohammed. So Mohammed, if you want to ask your question, go ahead and jump in. Looks like your uh, your mic is muted. I'm not sure if you're speaking or you just took off. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have no question. Yeah, I don't see. Better. Go ahead. Ask your question. If it's not ready, let me. Um, I think Mohammed is not ready, so let me let me just jump in um, and ask my next question again. Um, that is the impact of headings um, with regards to um, search ranking, because I see a lot of um, WordPress plugins um, having um, suggestions. Like when you are when you are doing on-page SEO, they tell you that maybe you should add your keyword in H2 um, tags or H3 tags. But um, I read an article a while ago that um, Google's George Muller was saying that wasn't a ranking factor, but I don't know why these guys still keep like having those suggestions. Uh, is there like some kind of um, hidden um, thing that we don't know? And if you guys um, would share your experience with us, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, so they've definitely dropped in, in uh, the, not the relevancy, but Google's kind of changed what they prioritize. For example, the whole keyword thing, that's kind of changed. But uh, to anybody that says that's irrelevant, it's absolutely not true. Um, personally, I use Yoast for WordPress websites, and they do a pretty good job of suggesting what you need there. For the most part, I follow it. There's times where I kind of override their suggestion. Uh, but just to just to make sure you have everything in order, those platforms are still good. And your tags in your site, as far as like the header tags and uh, those meta descriptions, those are still very important. I wouldn't listen to people that just you know, say that's irrelevant. Those are the same people that usually say SEO is dead for whatever reason. Uh, it's just it's just all about how you approach it because Google ch does change their their weight on certain things. Uh, there's So they're always changing that up, but it's still absolutely relevant in today's world. Yeah, and just to add, I, I think, uh, Dennis, I, I read that article too by John Mood that I think Abdul's talking about, you know, saying that, Google doesn't really care if you have two H1s or, you know, just H6s or whatever. But keep in mind also that, you know, there's the whole accessibility piece to that as well. And, you know, people using screen readers, for example, where, you know, you're going to have you're, you're going to benefit from having that hierarchy. So, you know, not everything's about SEO, obviously. Um, people always say, you know, don't write your content and uh, for, for SEO purposes like, you know, write it for, for the people primarily. Um, so I think, you know, keep that in mind just because Google doesn't care if you have, you know, three H1s um, still still have that hierarchy is, is better than not having the hierarchy, right? So, but definitely use header tags and all that. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, it, it is a best practice. Yeah, I, I think that's just Google also getting better at how, how they're able to read your site too. They're able to understand that content and they're becoming more effective in it. And uh, Danny, I think you're raising your hand or just saying hi, let, let us know. Go ahead and speak up. Yeah. One thing that I was going to kind of say, I know I joined late, so I don't know if this has been covered yet or not, but I don't feel like maybe it has been. But one thing that I think a lot of people are not like regarding when it comes to SEO, they're always thinking about, you know, like, for example, backlinks and things like that. But I think one important thing also is some of the metrics when it comes to like your Lighthouse scores and like really considering like the FCP or the LCP of the page, like those are big things that can affect theoretically like where you can end up ranking on a site and a poor like uh, LCP score, um, a largest content, a contentful paint, I believe it's called, uh, is the, the score for that. And based on the largest element on that page on its load time, like if it takes too long to load, it will derank you 
dramatically. And I know even like my first experiences with uh, SEO was actually in my last position. And um, I, I spent four months working on things related to that. And I know like that was a huge factor for several things of being noticed. And uh, like, for example, if you go through your Lighthouse scores, I think the, the two main ones that we can, like were really concerned with was like the first contentful and like the largest contentful, like how long it took for that. And like, I think the, it's, it's been a while since I looked at this and I was actually gonna write an article about this the other day cause I was talking to somebody about that. But like, if it's taking you longer than like two seconds to load like the largest content piece on the page, you're in bad territory after that two second mark. So two seconds should be the goal. But the other thing is, and I wrote about this the other day, if you have a, like a ton of like unused like JavaScript or CSS being loaded on a page, that could also be hurting your um, your load times. And oftentimes that could be a direct re reflection of where you would rank with your SEO as well. So I don't think it's always a keyword based, like keywords definitely play a factor in all that good stuff. But if you're not paying attention to the actual functionality of the site as well, that could really be killing a lot of like the rankings that you would have so to speak yeah for sure we, we talked about it earlier when we were starting up like you know based on you know if, if if you have a poor performance of a website and even if your you know seo is locked down and you're getting a bunch of users you know if your website takes 20 seconds to load everybody's going to hit the back button and find a better option right so it's kind of so definitely yeah, it's a rank and and even you know in the last little while Google has been saying that you know it is a ranking factor page performance so a lot of people have been trying to fix up uh, page performance issues so it's definitely I just want to echo it is important yeah there's one more thing too that I would even say I'm just remembering this now so like I can't remember the name of the tool maybe somebody knows this but we had a tool uh, I, I'm really trying to remember the name and I can't remember it but like it would basically show you like your competitors or you could enter whatever website name but it, your competitor theoretically like their best performing pages and like ways that it's performing really strong so like it could be like due to backlinks or it could be due to certain keywords and it would like populate those for you i can't remember the tool name i know i found by googling i found a similar tool by like semrush but it doesn't look like the tool that we were using so uh, I, maybe a little bit of research you can kind of find out what that would be but uh that could definitely help you out as well like kind of mimicking what like your best competitors theoretically doing in the space. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a good one is uh, Kyle suggested earlier is um, a good free one. I would say is Uber suggest. You know, if if uh, people are just starting out and want to kind of scope out what their competitors are doing and stuff, that's a good one to to try out. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other free ones. I, I haven't. I, I did a post a few times about you know like free SEO tools. Um, I use Ahrefs, uh, Jeremy mentioned as well. It's a popular one that he uses that as well. Uh, I mean, it's a good one, but yeah, it's um, it's it's definitely out of reach for new people. However, what I will mention, what a lot of people don't know, is both SEMrush and Ahrefs, you can sign up for a free account. And I encourage everybody to do that when they're starting out. You can do one audit of your own personal site using those uh, those websites. So sign up for a free account do an audit of, of your own website, take a look at the issues that it comes back with, and then learn that way. Learn by fixing those issues. That, that's, that's, that's the way I learned when I was starting out. Um, I learned mainly through using SEO tools, free SEO tools, where I was kind of like, uh, you know, checking out different concepts and different things that it was recommending for me to do to improve on my website. Um, I looked into all of those in detail and, and, and try to learn about those, uh, those concepts. So I'm not sure how much experience you all have in this type of SEO because I know uh, Kyle and Matt, you deal with a lot of WordPress websites, but uh, how, how, how have the effects of JavaScript websites or a, a lot of JavaScript on websites like single page applications, uh, what kind of impact have they had on these and uh, what have you seen as far as solutions in order to fix this? Because with frameworks like React and Angular, things have really changed. So I don't know where your background is on that, but... I'd love to maybe open up the conversation that way because I do know there's quite a bit of people in here that are building those styles of those types of applications. Maybe Jeremy has some insight on this. I know for uh, React, there's React Helmet and they've definitely improved on it. But basically with the way your website loads, it takes a little bit longer for everything to actually render and the browser can't just read your HTML content like it normally would. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, um, the 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 fundamentals when you're talking about SEO fundamentals, they're they're applicable to any platform. So it really doesn't matter if you're using React or any other JavaScript framework or just pure CSS, HTML or WordPress or whatever. Like you can apply all of these best practices to any platform. The reason I like WordPress is because you can automate a lot of this stuff. So, for example, if you're building a, a React website, you're going to have to implement some sort of functionality to create sitemaps for your website. Just one example. In WordPress, that comes out of the box, and it's automatically configured to look for changes in your on your website and your posts and whatever, and it updates the sitemap automatically, right? You mentioned SEO tools. SEO tools also help. Um, there's a there's a bunch of free SEO plugins for WordPress that really help uh, you know Im improve your SEO scores. That's another one where you know uh, you can automate a lot of stuff with uh, with WordPress. So that's why I personally prefer WordPress for these types of projects. I'm not saying it's the best framework for every project, but you know for small businesses that are kind of interested, small to medium businesses that are interested in creating content on their own. Um, ranking from an SEO perspective, I usually will recommend WordPress as a platform for those reasons because it's really, and I have actually, I have a blog post about that, about, about why why I think personally it's the best platform for SEO. Yeah, I would definitely suggest the same thing. I mean, if you're talking about a small business website, there's probably no reason you should use React for that. I mean, you still could, but there's still some technicalities that are going to be different or some technicals in that process. Like you're your basic strategies of link building and writing the content is going to be the same, but there is some differences in how how you need to configure a few things. I know it's gotten a little bit better uh, with React specifically. I know there are tools that kind of allow for this to to function better and how Google reads everything, but there are certainly those effects. I'm just curious if anyone uh, at some point, even somebody in the audience wants to elaborate on that. Um, I'd be curious to hear that. And we have someone else requesting to speak too. So if you want to ask a question, go ahead and request to speak. We'll add you. Uh, Dennis, maybe I could just add on to uh, what Nat said. I just want to reiterate that the framework or the platform doesn't really matter. The bottom line is obviously the other factors matter. I mean, as long as the website loads fast, as Danny mentioned, and all of those uh, content and you know all, all of that type of stuff. I mean, I mean that's important. I mean, if if I look at my website, right? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Carl. Yeah. I just uh, I just muted him. Um, <laughs> is it N Najib? I uh, will we'll mute you for a second, and then you can uh, ask the question after Kyle. It looks like there was a lag there. <laughs> so just wait for Kyle to be done. Okay. Okay. Cool. cool. Okay. So so. Just on my website, right? If you, if you look at my website, stay with development, and uh, really, it's actually, to be honest with you, it's terribly coded. I coded it years ago when I just knew the basics and I was still learning and whatever. I'm too lazy to to update it. I don't really care. <laughs> and 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 um, basically, it actually still ranks quite well. I mean, I mean, if you type in like things like best web development courses 2021, I mean, I'm competing with you know Udemy and other ones, and it still ranks on the first page. And the other one is if you type in like how to charge for a website, it actually ranks number one on Google. But for that one, I must be honest with you. I actually asked uh, Danny because he works at Google, you know, to pull some strings. So that helped me quite a bit. So thanks, Danny. Yep, no problem. Happy to Yep. yep. Uh, off topic, I guess, before uh, the Jeep can talk, I had a client one time get mad at my ranking, the fact that I didn't rank them in a month, and he told me to call Google. So, Danny, I guess I'm just going to reach out to you anytime I need a good ranking. So we'll chat. <laughs> Najib, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, so, um, I, wa uh, I wanted to ask that, does, lo does lo loading time on our website, I mean, does loading time, time on our website reflects the ranking of the website? I mean, the ranking on the Google page yeah so I'll, I'll answer that one then um it 100 does for multiple reasons first of all google is gonna look at i keep saying google but i'm just gonna say search engines they do see that load speed and they can see those metrics uh not only that but you're also gonna hurt other metric on metrics on your site so we talked about this before where somebody goes to your website if they leave right away because it's taking too long to load that's going to affect your bounce rate, which is going to have a negative impact. So 
your site speed will 100% affect your your ranking. So it has a huge impact on it. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, when, when uh, another question I have is that when I build when I build projects with, with React, I face too many loading times. What I can do best to re- to reduce all those issues and problems to in order to solve the solve the so loading times. Yeah. That's a whole other uh, discussion. I mean, you can go into figuring out why that loading time is slow. React should be fast, but it, I mean, React is fast on its own, but. Uh, as far as your queries, how you're querying the database, what you're loading, maybe uh, try to paginate data if it's because you're loading too much information, if you're rendering it out in a certain way. So just look at what's causing that load speed. There is no one answer to say, do this and it'll speed up your website. You can try adding caching to the website, uh, whether that's low level caching or uh, different methods and applying that, but find out why your website's slow and fix those issues and that'll that should optimize it. And it looks like Kyle wanted to jump in here. Uh, yeah, cool. It's actually the first time I raise my hand on the spaces. Okay, pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks, Danny, for the heads up. Um, okay, yeah, just uh, I just wanted to mention to Najib and also to the other listeners because uh, the bottom line is SEO can be learned and it's really not as difficult as what you may think. It's just some basic fundamentals. As long as you follow those fundamentals and principles, you're golden. So what I would suggest to you, Najib, and to also the listeners who want to learn more about SEO literally just type in on-page SEO back linker or learn on-page SEO and I'm sure you're going to find some great resources if you go to, you know, on the first or second uh, ranking and you just literally spend some time, spend an afternoon, spend an hour, spend two hours and I can guarantee you, you'll learn so much from those nugget overviews. Um, yeah, that's my that's my two cents on that. And then the other one is um, load speed is very important. Uh, Najib, as Danny did mention uh, with the lighthouse and all that, which you can definitely elaborate on. Um, the other thing I, I want to say is that um, if you look at, um, uh, how can I say, website visitors today, right? Most website visitors are actually done on mobile. So I just do want to also um, uh, th- you know, mention the user experience because a lot of people always try and focus on how it looks on a website, how it looks on, you know, a MacBook and screens and whatever, but don't forget on the phone because you need to, uh, um, how can I say, uh, instead of thinking purely like an SEO, you know, search engine optimizer, how to rank on Google, think of the user, you know, how would, uh, put yourself in the user, in the reader's shoes what would you like to read? Why should I trust this business? How will it benefit me? What am I going to get out of it? How much will it cost? And just, you know, pretty much address the doubts and and uh, more from a psychological point of view. And SEO is just, you know, a part of that. So I wouldn't focus on SEO as the thing. I would focus on it as, as like um, after CRO and the psychological point of view. That's my two cents on that. Cool. Yeah, one thing that I'd say, uh, as we already covered, site speed definitely um, is a factor. One other thing that I would tell you, uh, it seems like there, there's some like um, misconceptions on certain items, and I definitely like the resource that Kyle um, gave out. One other th- resource that I would recommend is web.dev. Uh, it's a website that is actually maintained and made by Google, and tons of lessons are in there. Um, a ton of lessons, even in like regards to like Lighthouse scores, and there's an entire SEL section as well with performance audits and all these kinds of lessons in there that are broken down step by step. So I think that would be really, really helpful for a lot of people that are trying to like break into it. And it even covers one thing that I wanted to um, actually say earlier that I forgot about is making sure that you have like a robots.txt file. Now, I don't know how applicable that would be to like a really, really small website, but you're basically in that file telling like search engines, not just Google, but all search engines, like which of the sites that like pages that it can crawl by crawling your website is getting like really vital information to kind of help in rankings as well. So that would be something that I would even like look into and consider more about. um, And that can definitely help your uh, ranking status. Thanks, Danny. Appreciate that. Um, we also have another person requesting to speak here, so go ahead and just uh, start talking here. We'll just unmute your mic. Sure. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. I'm trying to figure out where SEO and sort of greater marketing 
web scripts fit into a website uh, modern day. So obviously Google Core Web Vitals has been released uh, recently and it's really affecting some of my load times on the site. And I'm worried that it's going to affect the SEO of the articles that I already have published. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to sort of prioritize when it comes to uh, different SEO and marketing initiatives. I was wondering if anybody had any insight on that. Um, can, can I get you to elaborate the question? Are you talking about scripts as in like, um, load, load, loading like JavaScripts or are we talking about like copy and stuff? Are you trying to solve performance issues or something uh, else? Performance issues mainly related to, to different, like, uh, like HubSpot, MailChimp, uh, full story, Google analytics, oh, okay. yeah, all yeah. of those different scripts. How are, you know, I, I'm kind of stuck in a, in a moment of where I'm trying to optimize for Google web vitals or core, core web vitals so that I don't lose my, my SEO rankings on articles that I've already built up over a few mm -hmm. years. So I'm kind of worried that I'm going to lose the SEO value on those because I'm, I'm sort of trying to think of it in a full circle environment, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, a lot of people will do like, you know, check their performance for their for their homepage instead of the blog pages as well which sometimes can be slower than your homepage because a lot of people optimize the the, the homepage but kind of leave the the, the content pages mm. alone and they may not be performing as well as the homepage but I mean there's no quick and easy solution unfortunately what I would do is um, I would go to, you know, the, the website Danny mentioned, web, web.dev slash measure or pay, uh, page feed insights, uh, do, do an audit of the website and then go through the recommendations that they give you in terms of, you know, what needs to be fixed and fix those. I, I know it's a little overwhelming when you're getting started, but I think, you know, that's a really good way to learn as well and, and learn um, uh, web web uh, web dev performance improvements is like go one by one and try to fix those issues. If you're using WordPress, there are some um, good ways. That's my area of expertise. So we do a lot of like engagements like that where we fix performance issues for people. But you know, a lot of it starts with like a, a good WordPress theme, yeah. for example. That's you know efficient. Another thing that really helps is using a good um, WordPress uh, caching plugin, for example. Uh, WP Rocket is a great one. It's a paid one, but it's a really good one where, you know, it, it does some of those things automatically cool. for you. So you mentioned a lot of those scripts and services that you're using, you know, it can defer those, for example, so it doesn't call those scripts every time unless you're using them. And there, there are a lot of tricks of the trade and a lot of things that you can do to improve it. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not easy and it definitely takes time. So what I would suggest is, you know, if you are using, are you using WordPress or something uh, WordPress. Else? Yeah, so if you don't have a if you don't have a, um, a a caching plugin, like you know that's that's priority number one. Um, I, I can even share some like if you actually look at my pinned tweet, I've got some good suggestions on how to improve your uh, WordPress performance. There are some things you can do definitely. Um, you know, the more plugins you have, the more services that you're using, the more integrations that you're using, the slower your site is going to be. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of it. So sometimes it's also worth looking at standardizing on, on a few tools or like, you know, uh, if you're using MailChimp, maybe use MailChimp for all of your newsletter needs or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, instead of like using three different services, right? That seems kind of obvious, but you know some people make that mistake. So the more services and plugins and things that you integrate with, the slower your website's going to be, unfortunately. So try to cut down on those and and uh, try to you know try to resolve the issues using a caching plugin is probably the easiest way to Perfect. do it. Perfect. Appreciate the insight. No problem. Okay, so we have uh, Adam. Adam, if you want to ask any questions. Hey, everybody. Um, so most of my clients don't have ongoing content going on their website in the sense that most of them don't blog. Uh, most of my clients, we're going to set up their website, we're going to do SEO up front, and then uh, not much changes uh, in the long run. You know, they, they might update some information within their site or update some pictures. But I'm wondering, should I be reviewing their SEO, you know, what I've put in their meta descriptions and their alt tags? And, and how do I 
determine if it's time to review that or is it sufficient that uh, their content gets SEO'd up front uh, if they're not you know, creating new blog posts and creating new content as they go. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I can jump in there a little bit. Um, I think if you're just doing kind of upfront stuff and, and like you said, they're not adding any additional stuff going forward, I think it's pretty much fine to leave some of that stuff alone, uh, mostly because Google is ending up re rewriting a lot of meta descriptions anyways. Um, so if you're taking the time to write a lot of meta titles and descriptions, uh, there's a good chance that Google's actually just overwriting that with what they think is potentially best for that given search engine results page. Um, so I probably wouldn't waste any time doing any of that. Um, potentially, you could look at some of the alt tags that are currently existing on images on their site, especially if they're changing those images frequently or if you are just comparing their existing pages on site to competitors and and seeing, you know, is there any changes going on in terms of the industry and the space itself to where you might need more custom images or you might need more detailed images. And in that case, I would consider changing it. Um, but for the most part, I'd say uh, if you're not doing any more unique content, it's kind of like a static site, then uh, there might not be any need to, to further optimize. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. The the hardest part right there is to get a client who doesn't want to create any content to actually make something because you can actually get stagnant at that point if they're not involved. But that's a whole other topic on its own. But definitely after you set it up, I think what Jeremy said is perfect. It's not that much you can do at that point or to change. Okay, so we have uh, another question from, I think it's Fasal. If I'm saying that right, sorry if I'm butchering your names. I'm terrible at this. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hello, hi. This is Faiza. And I'm from Pakistan. And I should thank you, the host and co-host, for uh, having this space session. Uh, very good informative discussion and question and answers we are listening. Uh, I wish to know one thing. Uh, the, is this a regular feature or once a week or is the very first session where you go on like about the SEO discussion? I appreciate it because I wish to uh, join it again also in future if I get to know the schedule about this SEO sessions. That's very informative. Thank you. Uh, we, sh we should set it up more often. I mean, this is the first time I'm hosting a space and this is because Nat and I had a disagreement and I had a, you know, I have a background in this. I've done it for a long time, not so much now. So we should probably start this more regularly. I would recommend following uh, Kyle and Nat for sure. Jeremy is obviously very educated in this field and maybe they'll be hosting spaces. So I don't know what the future holds here if they want to host some more, but make sure to follow them and they'll be making announcements if they're hosting anything else. Yeah, for sure. Dennis set me straight in a tweet, and then he wanted to further, you know, uh, rub salt on my wounds here in a, in a space as well. That's exactly it. I stab the knife in, and I twist. <laughs> 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 no, that was a good one. I mean, I, I wish that's how all Twitter conversations went, where we disagreed, and, and we re-educated each other and had a good time, and I actually agreed with your point and uh, came to a conclusion here. So I was actually the one that yeah, was kind yeah. of wrong in one area. <laughs> The world would be a better place if everybody was like that. <laughs> For sure. All right. So if anyone else has any more questions, uh, we're almost at two hours here. Let's uh, go through a few more. If you all want to have a, a conversation about any other topics, uh, I would love to at some point maybe make this more of an open discussion, just kind of like a panel where we can, uh, or more like a podcast style and kind of break down certain things and just discuss it. But I definitely want to get the audience involved here. So uh, it looks like we have one more request here. So go ahead and uh, if you raise your hand and you're in line, just start speaking and we'll uh, just make, make sure, sure that, that you have a to speak. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I have randomly seen this space from Danny Johnson. So I have joined it 10 minutes before. So as we got talk regarding cache memory in some speech, I want to know about cache, how it's important in websites. C-A-C-H-E, cache, is it? Okay. So, caching? Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. So now uh, I just, uh, yeah, I, can, I, can, I just uh, I muted the mic, that. sorry. I mean, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just muted the mic just to make sure there was no echo. Uh, looks like there was a 
Oh, okay. Echo from the mic there. So yeah, ahead. there was a bit of an echo, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, I work with WordPress mainly, and, you know, for WordPress, caching is a must because it's not, you know, a static uh, website solution. So it makes uh, round trips to the database often. Every time somebody, you know, visits a page or a website, it'll go and query the database. And so if you don't have caching, enabled you know it really slows down your site so i would say caching is a must for wordpress especially but it's also good practice to have it for other frameworks and tools as well but for for wordpress it's an absolute like you need caching otherwise you're dead in the water just because it's not as as efficient as as having like a headless type of a environment or having a, a static version of a website which is just like html and css and javascript for example so you do you want to make sure if you have wordpress caching is a must and if i'm I'm not sure if I if I if I've actually seen this, but some themes actually have that built into their sites too. I forgot. A, I'm building a site for a client right now. I outsourced the work, but the person that set up the theme, it looks like it was already installed into that. So it looks like there's probably plugins for that. I haven't done it much with WordPress, but it's also built into some of the themes that are provided. If I'm not mistaken, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might yeah, be. yeah it it's might also. Be. It's all... <laughs> It's also available through some hosts, like hosts will have caching on, on the hosting side as well. Um, so like, you know, like the big ones like Kinsta and Pantheon and those ones already have uh, caching available on all of their uh, websites. So it it really depends, you know, uh, shared hosting environments might not. So you, you might have to set up something on your own. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of free options. W3 Cache is great, for example. It's a free one. Uh, that you can use for WordPress. Uh, there's a few other ones. I'm forgetting the names now, but um, yeah, it's it's definitely a must for WordPress, especially. Thank so it looks like we have a few more people. Thank you for explaining. Thank you. Hi, I, I had a, a question about sort of like topic clustering. So once you, you've done a good job with SEO research, you started creating content, um, you're starting to get good results, what should the next step be on those particular topics on your website that you're, you're ranking really well for? Should you start creating more blog articles related to that? Should it be more video, YouTube focused? Um, what does that next step look like after you start getting good traffic from a handful of keywords? yeah that's a really good question um so to give a little bit of an example of something that we've done so uh, last year i acquired a software tool called wordable.io um, and something we've done in terms of the content is, is essentially similar to what you're asking right now so kind of testing the waters in terms of different topical niches and seeing which ones you start to pick up rankings for um, and then from there, you can do a really deep dive in terms of like the whole gamut of keywords revolving around that topical niche. Um, so for example, we are a tool that publishes like content from Google Docs to WordPress. Um, and so one of the topics that we explored was essentially diving into the whole array of uh, Google Suite features. So anything on Google Docs or Google Docs related, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we ended up diving deep in terms of all those subtopic niches. So instead of just doing a, a head keyword of like, you know, how do I publish from Google Docs to WordPress? We really dove into all the Google Docs features. So anything like, you know, how do I format stuff in Google Docs? How do I add images in Google Docs? How do I add alt tags in Google Docs? So there's like potentially hundreds, if not thousands of sub keywords there that actually get a quite a decent amount of volume per month. So I think really diving deep into a few topical niches that you find good initial traction on is a good idea. So really just doing anything in like Ahrefs or SEMrush where you're looking at uh, phrase matches or, or anything in terms of like keyword relations, like looking at the different phrases that are common between those different keywords um, and really just kind of building a large list that you can potentially target there that's really focused on one topic. Um, so if you're finding good initial traction, you're likely going to have success if you're just kind of going down the line with those keywords and producing more content in a similar fashion. Mm, great insight. Thank you so much.
Yeah, um, if I can maybe add on to that uh, on on what Jeremy said because it was one hundred percent. I think I think I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Blythe. I think um, that's right. <laughs> but oh, awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, just to add on to it. So, so uh, I think we mentioned earlier uh, what you can do to find the uh, like these types of content is to actually type in the search. Uh, terms that you would like to rank for on Google and then just look at the auto suggestions. Also, if you hit enter and go to the bottom of the page, you'll see a few more um, suggested, uh, you know, content ideas that that you could use. But the one that I'm using now recently is, uh, you know, if you type in something, it's not for all searches, but if you type in something and then, you know, maybe sort of halfway down the page, I would say 25% down, it says people also ask. And those types of questions are, you know, the search snippets. And ideally, you would also like your article to rank there. And how do you do it? Well, one of the ways that I find, obviously, needless to say about, you know, the other on-page SEO factors and all that type of stuff, but bottom line is create quality, quality content and make sure that your content also addresses and answers those people. Or, no, sorry, those, uh, what's it called now? People also ask, yes. So, and, and then also... Um, uh, Dennis also mentioned, uh, you know, create some YouTube videos. Remember, Google owns YouTube. <laughs> so obviously, they'll be favorable to, to that. And, and what I do is on very, very important search terms for my own website and client websites and all that stuff, I would make sure that I have a YouTube video on that specific topic as well, also embedded in the article. So I would suggest that um, you do read further on this from a strategic point of view. And uh, what I like is if you type in content SEO, backlinker, you'll read an awesome, awesome guide on this topic to dominate your niche. Cool. Yeah, I, I love, uh, love the points both Kyle and Jeremy made. Uh, you definitely want to try to dominate that keyword in relative keywords. You want to strike while the iron is hot. If you have momentum, uh, try to make something relevant because there's a good chance you'll continue to rank for that. If you if you leave that as is and you don't approach that, uh, there's always somebody somebody else that's trying to compete for that same keyword. So if you're not trying to strengthen that presence with you know extra articles or extra videos, there's a good chance that you can potentially get beat out for that, and that's what you want to kind of be careful with. So yeah, I think that's the the summary of what everyone said here was just to keep adding to it. Yeah, one potential thing to add there too is, is kind of taking a look at the search engine results page for any given keyword that you're thinking of doing extra video content for or any sort of added value content in that sense. Um, a lot of these search results are starting to display YouTube results within them. Um, so if you see and you're noticing that, then you can also capitalize on essentially taking up two ranking spots on the first page for the same keyword if you're producing a YouTube piece of video there as well. And then you can also drop that YouTube video within the original article uh, just to, you know, boost on page time, boost, you know, relevance as well. Um, so that's just another little tip that I've been seeing at least in, in many search results pages that are coming up, um, especially for more higher volume keywords. You know, and I've seen the impact of that to be very strong, actually, when I'll put out a YouTube video, because that's where I can get the ranking faster due to you know the presence that I currently have there. That video can get thousands of views. And any article that I link within that, I'll often see my YouTube video and then that article just pop up within a matter of days. So you're definitely dominating those results if you, if you try both approaches. And they do definitely bounce off of each other and help out. Yeah, absolutely. And then too, if you look at like the latest date published, so if you're doing just a, a Google search for a given keyword, you see some YouTube videos pop up, it'll usually tell you the date that those YouTube videos were published. And, and typically they're usually a bit outdated. So maybe even like a year, two, three years. Um, and that's a really good opportunity to essentially skip the line of like the Google sandbox that you typically fall into when you publish a fresh piece of content. Um, if you're publishing something on YouTube and it's a really good quality video, you might be able to skip that uh, essentially waiting period where you're you know trying to get that content piece picked up and build links to it. And you might be able to get that you know, little coveted video spot in the top couple results faster than you might have been able to uh, with just content alone. Yeah, great point. Uh, if we have any more questions, uh, go ahead and request to speak. We'll add you up here. Um, Adam, you, had, you already asked your question, right? I can't remember if you asked the question or not. I want to make sure we get to everyone here. Yep, I'm good. I asked about static websites without changing content. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. 
I'll remove you, so don't be offended from the speaker spot. <laughs> All right, so Kyle, Nat, do we have any more topics we wanted to cover while we have everyone here? We'll just give it a few more minutes while uh, we give people a chance to request to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we covered a lot. So, yeah, I would like to do a few more of these for sure in the future. So, I, yeah, I'm happy to have some positive feedback from people. So it sounds like people have learned stuff. So definitely want to make these a little bit more frequent. It's just, it's sometimes it's hard to find the time, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for uh, everybody that's interested in SEO, uh, Nat posted a link of resources. We talked about keyword research tools. We also went into people that you should follow, people like Brian Dean. Uh, there was also Neil Patel and any other resources like that. If you're looking for another space like this, I'll try to encourage Nat, Kyle, and myself to host a few more of these. So make sure you're following everyone on the panel here. Jeremy, obviously with great insights. I'm not sure how involved he'll be with hosting the spaces. Jeremy, I definitely hope you do. Uh, but if you're looking for more spaces, Twitter spaces on this topic, make sure to give everyone a follow and we'll uh, see everyone in the future. So uh, we have one more question. Let's quickly address this one and then we'll just close it out with a question from Antonio. And then we'll uh, hey, uh, uh, go ahead. Dennis, I just wanted to say, instead of following Neil, follow Kyle and Jeremy instead. Neil, Neil does post very good content. Does he? I, I don't know. Uh, I actually don't follow him on Twitter. <laughs> I watch him on YouTube, so I'm not sure what he's about here. <laughs> Kyle and Jeremy will give you way better info. Trust me on that. Awesome. Okay, we'll follow them then. <laughs> All right, so uh, Antonio, go ahead and ask your question. Well, actually, here, let me add him to speak. I just realized I didn't do that. All right, so Antonio, you are up. Yes, hello, hello. Um, thank you for doing this uh, TED conference. Uh, actually, my question is not related to um, SEO, but uh, it's something with WordPress. Wondering if you could put some light on this. Um, I'm used to um, coding HTML, CSS, and uh, JavaScript. Um, however, seeing some, seeing this trend that many people say that WordPress is a good option. I was wondering, what is your opinion if a web developer has uh, his portfolio made in WordPress? Is that, do you think it's a minus or is a positive? Or what is your opinion on that, please? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I most of the sites we develop for clients are WordPress. I'd say over 95%. The rest are like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, I think it's a great option for SEO, especially if you're interested in SEO. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, a lot of content I see on Twitter is like a little bit anti WordPress, maybe because it's not shiny and cool or maybe, you know, people consider it slow if they don't know how to use it properly, for example. So, I mean, I, I, I think I, I try to debunk all of those myths as much as I can on, on Twitter, but uh, we use it all the time. It's the most popular WordPress or um, CMS framework uh, in the world. It's also, you know, 43% of all websites run WordPress. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a good choice. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's popular to to hate on the platform that's on top, but WordPress is still dominant. It depends on what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to display your content, there's no reason why WordPress shouldn't be used. I, I actually tend to hand code all my applications and build more uh, larger scale apps. And I still use WordPress when it comes to smaller clients uh, just because it's very convenient. So I absolutely see nothing wrong with it. It's going to be a great choice if you're trying to build your own platform just to display some work. And if you happen to pick up a client or two that you need to uh, put together a project for really quickly, it'll absolutely do. So it depends on the use case, but in most cases, it's going to be just fine. So uh, if everyone just wants to uh, say something at the end, if you guys have any closing remarks, we'll uh, just close it out here. That'll be it for the questions. Uh, Nat, Kyle, Jeremy, thank you so much for being here. If you wanted to just throw something in here at the end, go ahead. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Dennis, for organizing. Let's do it at the same time, Ned. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks for uh, letting me jump in there and in, in kind of the middle. But uh, it was super fun to chat with everyone and all the great questions that came in. So uh, looking forward to it if we do another one. For sure. Yeah, definitely an awesome panel. I feel honored to be able to host this with 
uh, three very, very uh, educated people in this industry. Uh, great insights from everybody. So we'll go ahead and close this out and we'll make any announcements in the future if we have another spaces coming up. So we'll see you then. Thank you.